Reed Hastings seems as tough as his DVDs. Practically indestructible. He has transformed the world of movies, TV, and cable twice. We rent DVDs. It's a flat price. It's really easy. He's one of the people that killed the video store. Oh, we would have liked nothing better than to bury Netflix. He defied his critics and bet his company on movies by mail when DVDs were a novelty. Most investors were just convinced Netflix was just another dot com. It was a, you know, a nichey little idea. People didn't want a subscription, and it would never take off. It took off and flew high for 12 years. Its value climbing to 12 billion dollars before a spectacular stumble stalled its growth. Netflix subscribers are fleeing en masse. More than 800,000 customers canceled their service last quarter. I've heard some people say that it feels like aliens have taken over his body. Hastings is determined to restore his company's reputation and his own. He comes across as sort of a typical Silicon Valley executive, very low key, but you know he's one of those guys who has to win. Ten, twelve years ago when we started Netflix, you know, the internet was still AOL dial-up. But we realized, wow, networks are just going to grow. And you know what's going to happen? All video is going to become click-and-watch internet video. Everything. Reed Hastings has made a career out of anticipating the future. First in a software tool, then with the simple DVD and a 32-cent stamp. You won't find anybody who has more drive than Reed Hastings. He's always thinking about um, the strategic shifts that need to be made. He is an incredibly focused, innovative individual uh, that is like smart, like light years smart. He's one of those guys who doesn't like to talk about himself a lot, but who really feels like his actions show, you know, how good a company uh, he can run. True to form, he declined to talk about himself for this program as well. Hastings was born in Boston, Massachusetts in 1960 and grew up in the suburb of Belmont. Former governor Gray Davis is a friend of Hastings. He came from a middle-class background. His father was a lawyer, did not come from great wealth. Uh, education is the reason he's successful. Educational success included a bachelor's degree from Bowdoin College in Maine. He spent one summer in a training program for the U.S. Marines, but realized the military wasn't for him. Instead, he joined the Peace Corps, where he taught for two years, then hitchhiked across Africa with ten bucks in his pocket. Teaching was inspiring, as he told Charlie Rose in this 2005 conversation. Well, I was a high school math teacher, originally out of college, um, in the Peace Corps uh, in Swaziland. Um, and I love teaching. I love, I taught high school math, and it was just a fantastic experience. Returning to the U.S., he got a master's in computer science at Stanford and landed a job at a technology company called Adaptive Corporation. Mark Box is a startup investor who was introduced to Hastings at the dawn of a new era in computer programming. He said, you know, up until this time, every program that's been created um, has been created in the head, essentially, of one person. But now we're kind of getting to the point where it takes two, three, five, ten guys to write a program. And so as that starts to happen, you have problems coordinating between the people, and that creates lots of errors. Errors Hastings thought he could fix. He wrote a program and started a company with Mark Box called Pure Software. Like all perfectionists, Hastings wanted to hire the best and quietly did whatever it took to get them. Aki Fujimura was then an experienced software manager at Cadence Design Systems. I didn't want to leave the company that I was with, but then uh, he came over to my apartment with a six-pack of beer, and uh, we started talking, and it's, uh, th that's his typical style. Audrey McLean was one of Hastings' first investors and a board member. Once we got going, there was no stopping it. The company doubled year over year for four years in a row. So it was an absolute rocket ship. By 1995, Pure Software had reached the holy grail of 90 startups, going public. On opening day, the stock shot up 75%. It was a very exciting IPO. In fact, we were the uh, most successful IPO of the year in 1995 for one week. The following week, Netscape went public and they eclipsed it. 
the success landed Hastings on the front page of USA Today in front of his flashy new Porsche Carrera, a photo he would come to regret. Cliff Edwards is a technology writer for Bloomberg Businessweek. I think he felt like it sort of portrayed him as a sort of rich whiz kid living the dream when in fact he really wanted to show that here's a company that he is uh, nursing uh, to health and, and is, is pouring his life into. Two years later, he sold the company for $750 million and turned his talents in a very different direction. Michael Kirst is a professor emeritus of education at Stanford University. I got a call from somebody I'd never heard of named Reed Hastings saying he wanted to come to Stanford and study state education policy and politics. And I wasn't quite sure why uh, he was interested in this because it didn't fit in with anything on his uh, resume. For Hastings, it was a new start. For six months, he studied hard then went to the state capitol to advocate for a new kind of school in California. And he was able to successfully create one of the first laws in charter schools in the country. So it allowed innovation and new operators to come in uh, and was really an entirely new concept for California. There was a new concept for Hastings as well. A familiar annoyance prompted Reed Hastings to reinvent an industry in 1997. He recalled getting a $40 late fee for a movie rental in this 2005 appearance on Charlie Rose. I remember I didn't want to tell my wife about it. And I thought, oh great, now I'm, I'm kind of compromising the integrity of my marriage over this late fee. So of course I did tell her about it, but um, it made me think I can't be the only one who is struggling with this late fee thing. And just started me thinking about the internet and DVDs um, and how uh, something could work without late fees. The movie rental industry made around $8 billion a year, nearly all of it from the dominant format of the day, VHS cassettes. Hastings saw the opportunity in a new format and a surprising new business, DVDs by mail. But first, he had to find out if the discs could survive the U.S. mail. So I stuffed a bunch of CDs and they couldn't buy DVDs then, put them, mailed them to myself, and then I had to wait for 24 hours to see them come home, uh, to see are they going to be all shattered into bits along with the, my idea. Uh, and then, you know, the next day, 3 o'clock, the postman arrives, and I rip open the envelopes, and the first one's in good shape, and the second one's in good shape, and the third one's in good shape, and I'm like, this sucker is going to work! In 1998, Hastings launched Netflix as the first online store to rent DVDs. Current Redbox president, Mitch Lowe, was a co-founder. We started in an old bank building. In fact, our inventory was in the old vault. There was about seven or eight people. Everybody was dedicated to figuring out how to do something uh, disruptive in the entertainment distribution business. They stocked up on DVDs from retailers like Best Buy. But there was a problem. Less than one in a hundred households owned a DVD player. They cost nearly $600, and no one knew when they'd become more affordable. He committed everything to DVDs. If, if DVDs didn't happen, he's got not, you know, the company's nothing. It's zero. Blockbuster and Hollywood Video dominated the industry, with thousands of retail stores in almost every neighborhood. If Hastings wanted to compete, he had to build a better customer experience. So he innovated with an idea an easy-to-use subscription service. For a monthly fee, members were allowed as many movies as they could watch, with no late fees. He realized having to resell the customer every time is a bad idea on a $3 transaction. And he eventually got the company to go to the subscription model, and I think that changed everything for him. That change was boosted by two popular features. The queue, a list of movies that the user wanted, and computer-generated recommendations that were surprisingly accurate. Michael Pachter has followed Netflix for 10 years as a research analyst with Wedbush Securities. The internet ordering mechanism and interface was innovative, the recommendation engine was innovative, and the queue was innovative. And I think where Netflix really thrived early on was they were first to figure all this stuff out. But for all their innovation, Netflix was still barely on the radar. Their revenues of $5 million at the start of 2000 vanished next to Blockbuster's $4.5 billion, 900 times the size of Netflix. In a bold and clever move, Hastings went for help 
to his biggest competitor. Everybody loved Blockbuster, and Blockbuster was the golden child, and Netflix was sort of this ugly uh, stepchild that was coming up, and everybody thought, well, this thing's not going to last. It's not going to have legs. It's going to die. We were having challenges as far as acquiring customers, and we saw Blockbuster as the greatest single source for rental customers. So we actually reached out to Blockbuster and invited them to become a strategic partner and, and an investor. Blockbuster, the entertainment giant, found it entertaining. John Antiaco had been Blockbuster's CEO for three years when Netflix came calling. We thought, well, if we're going to get in this business, we probably shouldn't give the internet rights to another company for uh, a couple percentage points. And that's what caused us to keep uh, evaluating whether we wanted to enter the business or not. I think that you know, Netflix was, was very lucky that Blockbuster, which, who was the sleeping giant at the time, didn't do anything. They stayed asleep. As Reed is a gentleman. I think if you had a different CEO at Netflix who was a little bit cockier and a little bit more brash, I think that Blockbuster might have been provoked into competing. There didn't seem much reason to compete. By the end of 2000, Netflix was hemorrhaging money. Their losses skyrocketed to $57 million. It just sounded like another dot-com idea, you know, like e-toys. And most investors were just convinced Netflix was, you know, a niche little idea. People didn't want a subscription, and it would never take off. While Netflix was struggling to become profitable in 2000, Reed Hastings did the unexpected again. He took an additional job on California's State Board of Education. Any of you who have tried to change large organizations know that half the battle is getting it on the right course. The second half of the battle is keeping it on that course. He was appointed by then-Governor Gray Davis. You know, if I was ever in a foxhole, I would like Reed Hastings with me because we would have discussions about the next school board meeting. And we would argue over what that decision would, uh, should be. But once, you know, we've kind of came to a decision, uh, he went in there and he held his ground and he got the reforms established. Netflix, on the other hand, was anything but established and heading into the dot-com dive. How the mighty have fallen. According to a recent study by Morgan Stanley Dean Witter, the average Internet stock is down two-thirds from its 52-week high. Having long planned to go public, Netflix filed preliminary papers as the market spiraled down. We faced a lot of obstacles in the first IPO attempt. The bubble had burst. Uh, there was the belief that uh, the business, that Internet businesses had no substance behind them. Uh, there was the anthrax scare. There was 9-11. It was just like the perfect storm of everything going in the wrong direction. Hastings canceled the IPO. In October 2001, Netflix had to lay off a third of the company. Netflix was on the brink of disaster. I think that between 1999 and 2002, Netflix could have gone under at any time had serious competition arisen. As the year was closing, Hastings got the break he needed. The price of DVD players plunged. And Hastings slipped a coupon for a free trial of Netflix in nearly every new box. Business took off. With the company back on track, the much-delayed IPO became a reality. In 2002, Netflix went public. The stock rose 12% the first day to $16.75, but it was a double-edged sword. Keith Terry tracks Netflix as the managing director of internet research at Canaccord Genuity. Going public got them a lot of attention, not just from consumers, but also com from competitors. And so they were going to start seeing pretty significant competition from companies like Walmart and, and entrenched players like Blockbuster. Walmart launched its competing service in 2003. A year later, Blockbuster also jumped in. We initially launched kind of the same way Netflix did, which is free trial membership. You know, one of the most beautiful words in the you know, American language is free. And that was getting us reasonable growth. Blockbuster's monthly fee was also $2 less than Netflix, igniting a nasty price war. Netflix slashed its price. Blockbuster countered. Walmart edged under both. So Blockbuster cut to rock bottom. 
In a conference call on the end of the year earnings, Hastings declared Blockbuster has thrown everything but the kitchen sink at us. Quite frankly, myself and a couple of key members of our management team were sitting in my office listening to the conference call. Someone said, well, why don't we send them a kitchen sink? I said, good idea. Next day we shipped one out. At that point, the rivalry was definitely established. The fierce competition on multiple fronts took its toll. Netflix stock plunged 75%. Analyst Michael Pachter commented that Netflix is a worthless piece of crap with really nice people running it. I was convinced that Blockbuster would compete effectively, and so it seemed to me that if Blockbuster was determined to retain its customers, that Netflix would disappear. Hastings wasn't going down without a fight. He sacrificed profits to drive back the competition and maintain the company's growth. It became a war of attrition. The view that you had out there was that Netflix wasn't going to be able to survive uh, this, this level of competition from a lot of people. And that Blockbuster and then Walmart were ultimately just going to squeeze the profits out of Netflix. And I think what both companies found in pretty short order was this business was a lot harder than they thought. While the battle with Blockbuster and Walmart raged, Reed Hastings suffered a personal setback. For four years, Hastings had championed public school reform on California's State Board of Education. But when he pushed for more English and bilingual programs, he was pushed out by Democratic representatives. It was a blow to him, and it was surprising, and it was, I would think, somewhat even humiliating to be turned down by your own political party. But he said, if this is the issue that you want to kick me off the state board about, then I go proudly with my head held high. Hastings focused his attention on his company's battle for the DVD by mail business. And in the middle of 2005, the tide began to turn. Walmart pulled out, giving Netflix their rental customers in exchange for promoting their sales. Blockbuster was gaining subscribers, but losing hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, it was Hastings' turn to call someone nice. We're not against Blockbuster. They're all nice people. They're, but our goal is to offer a better service that consumers prefer us to them, and that eventually that does result in them closing. In 2007, at the Sundance Film Festival in Utah, Antiaco said he was called to a private summit with Hastings to explore the possibility of a deal. His preference would have been for Netflix to buy Blockbuster online, and what we proposed back was a merger. It never got beyond talks because of concerns about antitrust regulations. By 2008, Antiaco was gone and Blockbuster backed away from its online business. They lost hundreds of millions of dollars trying to compete with Netflix, and they just didn't have the cash to keep up competing at the level. And you knew at some point they were going to have to give up, and ultimately that's what happened. It was a triumph for Netflix. But no sooner had Hastings secured the movie-by-mail business than he launched a new service that would mean the demise of the DVD. Netflix delivered its billionth DVD in 2007. Hastings was about to reinvent his company with a service that promised to make DVD by mail obsolete. Streaming video online. It was what he had foreseen from the very beginning of Netflix. It just took a decade to arrive. If there's anything you would want to bank on, it's that technology will keep making bandwidth um, faster and cheaper. Bandwidth may have been cheaper, but not the shows themselves. Unlike DVDs, Netflix needed a license for every movie it streamed, and fees were astronomical. Andrew Wallenstein is an editor for the Hollywood News Daily Variety. I think the kind of titles Netflix first started out with streaming was probably the bottom of the barrel. It was kind of the, the movies or TV programs that were long forgotten, not the best stuff. I remember making you know, a mocking comment in a research note about how no one wanted to see Revenge of the Nerds 3 when it was a new movie back in you know, the early 90s. So they certainly didn't want to see it in 2007. Even if they did, Netflix could only stream to one device, the personal computer. We don't watch movies on our PC. He's going to stream to the PC. Who cares? And we thought it was nuts. We really thought he was nuts. So Hastings offered the new service to subscribers for nothing. And when he then announced 
and we're going to provide this for free, we were sure he was nuts. He pursued even more content, adding 11,000 titles in less than two years. And finally, he secured a breakthrough deal for first-run movies and shows. I think you have to go back a few years to the deal that they struck with Stars, which enabled them to get some great films out of the Sony library, the Disney library, and they only made that deal for something like $20 million, which in retrospect was the steal of the decade. Deals followed with many of the major studios. And it's my pleasure to introduce Netflix CEO, Reed Hastings. More impressive was how rapidly Netflix expanded the world of streaming to geek gadgets. The iPad has been a tremendous success for it. And almost every entertainment system on the planet. Content and access drove phenomenal growth. By 2011, subscribers hit 20 million, topping $2 billion in revenue, had grabbed the attention of industry goliaths, Amazon, Apple, Google, and Facebook. They're all 800-pound gorillas, and this is sort of the danger point for Netflix. If you were thinking of any time where they may have faced more pressure, I can't think of one. Surprisingly, the real pressure for Netflix didn't come from those other tech giants, but from a series of spectacular self-inflicted wounds. In July 2011, Netflix announced that it was raising its monthly subscription fee 60%. 800,000 subscribers defected. Two months later, a contrite Hastings apologized. We're making this video today to apologize in person. He went on to announce that Netflix would split its DVD and streaming businesses. The price increase remained, but DVD by mail would become a new brand, Quickster. The move fell flat. Customers and shareholders continued to flee, dumping subscriptions and stock. Netflix, now in a downward spiral, was forced to backtrack. Netflix pushing the rewind button today. The company coming out with a big flip-flop, saying that Quickster is dead and that the DVD and streaming services are back under one umbrella. Now, the reason for the reversal is simple. Customers just didn't like it. Hastings delivered yet another apology, this time for moving too quickly. Quickster became the symbol of uh, Netflix not listening. And we quickly um, changed course on that, and we're going to stick with DVD as part of the Netflix brand. It was an epic collapse. Netflix lost almost two-thirds of its value in three months, including a stunning $2.3 billion in one day. And if that wasn't enough bad news, Netflix and stars parted ways, depriving Netflix from newer films from Disney and Sony, leaving the impression that Netflix was losing content as it raised prices. Hastings moved quickly and announced new content deals with DreamWorks Animation, Relativity, AMC, CW, and others. Despite the stumbles, Hastings says he never considered stepping down. He said he wants to be measured by the success of 12 years rather than the mistakes of 12 weeks. I think Reed has changed the way we all think about consuming entertainment. He's expanded the options and the way you get movies. I would not count out Reed Hastings and Netflix. I think, again, that they are a company that knows their challenges, uh, that they don't hide from them. There's very few companies that have done this many things and succeeded. And, you know, 12 years later, you know, again, it's one of those companies where you may not like the company, but you can't argue about its successes.